October the 26th, 1973, and the research vessel Sula sails out of Sutton Harbour to spend a yet another winter's day trawling for squid over the inshore fishing grounds near Plymouth. Weather permitting, the ships of the Plymouth Marine Laboratory have been doing this for at least 40 years. This film explains why these animals have attracted so much attention for so long. In the first place, squid are intensely interesting animals in themselves. They are jet-propelled predators, a habit which demands keen observation and immediate, precise responses. As a result, they have many of the characteristics which we normally associate only with the vertebrates. But squid are not vertebrates. They are allied to the sedentary seashells of our shores and belong to a far older group of animals, the cephalopods, whose ancestors once dominated the ancient Paleozoic and Mesozoic seas. In modern forms, the lower half of the body consists almost entirely of the mantle cavity, and it is the contraction of its muscular wall which expels seawater out through the funnel or siphon just below the head. About 400 species are probably alive today, and many of them are numerous enough to provide important fisheries, especially in Japan, where about half a million tons are landed annually. Around Britain, large specimens of Laligo forbsi and Laligo vulgaris, a foot or more long, are readily available in the English Channel during the autumn. The laboratory at Plymouth, then, is particularly fortunate as it is one of the few research centres where they can be conveniently studied. The head is distinct from the body and bears conspicuous eyes and arms set with rows of suckers. On each side of the tapered body there are large lateral fins used when the squid is cruising gently along. Jet propulsion is used for escape or attack, seawater being drawn into the mantle cavity through openings just behind the eyes and then forced out through the siphon when the mantle suddenly contracts. A 350 gram squid can squirt about 200 milliliters of water, about half a pint, in less than a fifth of a second. To achieve this, the nervous system must ensure that all the different mantle muscles involved must, even in a squid several feet in length, receive the stimulus rapidly and simultaneously. Professor J.Z. Young began his detailed studies of the squid's nervous system in 1933. Opening the mantle cavity in the mid-ventral line exposes the squid's true body wall, through which the viscera can be seen the muscular siphon itself, and on each side, close to the inhalant openings of the mantle cavity, a large ganglion. This is called the stellate ganglion, and when the gill is removed, the reason is clear. Numerous nerves just below the skin radiate from it in a star-like pattern. Professor Young showed that each stellate ganglion has about ten of these nerves and that they fan out to all parts of the mantle wall. He also showed that each of these stellar nerves contained a large transparent tubular structure, about a millimeter in diameter, which Young at first took to be a blood vessel. In transverse sections though, he found that this structure was, apart from its size, little different from the numerous small nerve fibers which surrounded it. Moreover, unlike a small arteriole, it never contained blood or amoebocytes. Examination of the stellate ganglion, particularly in the small transparent squid Allotuthis, showed that all these tubular structures arose within the ganglion itself. 
closer examination of the dissected ganglion confirmed this, and detailed studies of its histology convinced Young in 1936 that each of these tubular structures must be a single nerve fibre, a giant axon formed by the fusion of very many smaller ones. Young confirmed this hypothesis when, using a pair of simple electrodes, he stimulated a stellar nerve. Large contractions of that part of the mantle served by the stellar nerve were only obtained if the tubular structure within it remained intact. These structures, therefore, must be single nerve axons, each almost a millimetre in diameter. The next step, of course, was the removal of a living stellar nerve and this has now become a routine procedure at those marine laboratories where squid are studied. After the head and viscera have been removed, the mantle is cut down the middle and one half pinned out in a transparent dissecting dish. Very little magnification is required to see the nerve and to cut away the overlying tissue. A simple copper sulphate heat filter cools the light and the seawater bathing the mantle is chilled to about 4 degrees centigrade. Different scientists use slightly different procedures for the removal of a nerve. At Plymouth, Dr. Meaves first lifts the stellate ganglion and then progressively frees the nerve from the mantle. Apart from removing any superfluous tissue, no further preparation of the nerve is required before simple physiological experiments can be made. It has long been known that as an impulse travels along a nerve fibre, the active region becomes electrically negative to all the neighbouring regions. Two electrodes connected to suitable amplifying and recording devices will therefore register a diphasic change as the impulse passes each electrode in turn. The change is only produced, though, if the stimulus is large enough because, like all single nerve fibres, the giant axon has an all-or-none response. This is the action potential, here continuously displayed because the frequency of stimulation is high. In 1938, Pumphrey and Young found that the conduction velocity of these axons increases with the square root of their diameter the giant axons being about five times faster than the small fibres. Moreover, they are graded in size. The largest, and hence the fastest, supply the most distant parts of the mantle. These giant axons thus play a vital role in the squid's life. They not only ensure that the escape response is as fast as possible, but also that all parts of the mantle contract simultaneously, an essential requirement for efficient jet propulsion. Of course, they are also one of the largest animal cells known to man, and many techniques have been developed for their study. In order to expose the giant axon itself, all the small fibres surrounding it have first to be removed. This is called cleaning the axon, one end of which is often left with the small fibres attached for handling purposes while the axon is prepared for the experiment. It usually takes about half an hour to clean an axon and to leave it bare of all the small fibres, often over a distance of about five centimetres. When finished, the giant axon alone remains, a single animal cell several centimetres in length 
and in this case about 650 microns in diameter. Each small division of the scale is 100 microns. A cell this size weighs about 20 milligrams, so that it is not surprising that the giant axon was first used as a source of cytoplasm. In 1937, Baer, Schmidt and Young, working at Woods Hole, studied the protein constituents from samples which they obtained simply by squeezing the cytoplasm out of the cut end. Later workers made precise measurements of the electrolytes and found that the concentration of potassium was much higher and that of sodium much lower than in the surrounding body fluids. It was for studies of the viscosity of cytoplasm that a cannula was first inserted into the axon and it has since proved such a valuable tool that it is now used routinely. A thread is attached at each end of the axon and pinned down to hold it taut. In addition, two threads which will later secure the cannula are slackly tied round it. The cannula itself is a carefully drawn piece of glass tubing the end of which has been ground down to form a smooth oblique tip, slightly smaller than the diameter of the axon. The next step is to cut, without severing the axon, a notch in its wall large enough to accommodate the cannula. A micro-manipulator provides the fine adjustment needed to pass the cannula through the notch and some distance along the axon. Once in place, the loop of thread is brought up and the cannula secured. Finally, the threads are trimmed and the uncleaned end of the axon removed. This is the preparation with which the basic mechanism of nervous conduction has been studied. An electrode was first placed inside the axon by Hodgkin and Huxley in 1939 at Plymouth and by Curtis and Cole in 1940 at Woods Hole. Hodgkin and Huxley first made a plastic cell and mounted it on a platform which could be raised and lowered like a lift. As Professor Baker shows, the axon held by the cannula was then hung in the cell, which was filled with seawater and connected to an external electrode. The internal electrode, which was not attached to the lift, was then placed vertically above the axon, with its tip in the cannula. It was centred with respect to the cannula and axon by placing a small mirror beside the axon arranged so that a second image at right angles to the first was seen through the microscope. By adjusting the position of the cell both horizontally and vertically the cannula and axon were now raised up over the tip of the electrode which always remained in the same line of sight. Hodgkin and Huxley found that as the electrode entered the axon, a negative potential with respect to the external seawater of about 65 millivolts was obtained. This was the resting potential of the axon, and although its existence had long been suspected, this was the first time it had been directly measured. Moreover, when the axon was stimulated, the action potential did not simply fall to zero during the impulse, but became positive with respect to the outside shown by the overshoot of the action potential. This important discovery suggested that the nerve membrane which at rest is mainly permeable to potassium becomes primarily permeable to another ion during excitation. This other ion is sodium since if its concentration in the external solution was lowered the action potential immediately became smaller by an amount depending on the sodium concentration. If, as these experiments suggest, the action potential was dependent on the passage of ions across the membrane, it was obviously important to measure the currents carried by these ions. To do this, it is necessary to hold the internal potential at a chosen value. 
This is the powerful voltage clamp technique, originally developed by Cole in America and applied by Hodgkin, Huxley and Katz. This technique requires that an extra electrode, the current electrode, be inserted into the axon. For this purpose, a double electrode was made by winding very fine silver wires around a thin glass capillary. As the wire, which was only 20 microns in diameter, was wound on, it was kept taut, as Sir Alan Hodgkin shows, by dangling a small piece of plasticine on the free end. The finished electrode consists of two entirely separate spirals, insulated where necessary by shellac varnish. While it is inserted in the same way as the simple electrode, the information it gives is quite different. As a change of potential is imposed on the axon, as seen in the top trace, the currents flowing across the membrane are revealed in the bottom trace. As the membrane is clamped by successively larger voltage pulses, so the direction of the currents across the membrane changes. The early downward dip, seen on the left, is the transient current carried by the influx of sodium ions. And it is superseded by an opposite and persistent current attributed to the outward flow of potassium ions. This suggestion was later confirmed by changing the potassium concentration within the fibre. In 1956, Hodgkin and Keynes made a micro-injector which could be inserted down the axon in the same way as the simple electrode. During tests, repeated here by Professor Keynes, the fine glass capillary contained a column of dye a few millimetres long. The syringe was mounted so that during injection, the barrel moved over the stationary plunger. Thus the capillary withdraws, leaving the injected solution behind. Of course, during an experiment, the solution was colourless, so its limits were marked by two small bubbles. This technique has proved particularly useful when used with radioactive isotopes. As Dr. Caldwell demonstrates, the external solution was sampled at known times after the injection of the isotope and its activity measured. These experiments showed the presence of a sodium pump in the membrane of the giant axon. This maintains the difference between the internal and external sodium concentrations and is driven by the breakdown of energy-rich phosphate. But the micro-injection technique could only add substances to the axoplasm. There was no opportunity of removing them. In 1961, Baker, Hodgkin and Shaw succeeded in doing just this. In this short sequence, made at the time, Professor Shaw shows how, with a device rather like a miniature garden roller, the axoplasm was gradually squeezed out. An uncleaned axon was used so that the small fibres surrounding it would give the membrane some protection. It was then possible to reinflate the axon by forcing an artificial solution through it, using, in these early experiments, an old gramophone motor connected through gears to a caliper syringe. During the rolling out process, some of the axoplasm is forced back up into the tip of the cannula. As the pressure builds up, this is forced out of the cannula and travels down the length of the axon as a small plug, until finally ejected. The lumen of the axon is now completely clear and solutions flow through it with ease. Previously, 
such an isolated membrane was thought to be completely dead. However, the striking fact was that this supposedly lifeless tissue still displayed all the essential behaviour of a living nerve. It could still conduct up to half a million impulses, even though large volumes of artificial solutions were streamed through it. This cannulated and perfused axon can, of course, be treated in exactly the same way as an intact one. A simple internal electrode will, as before, give the resting potential. Here, about 80 millivolts. But now, unlike the earlier experiments, it is a simple matter to change the internal solution. If the new solution, which rapidly displaces the old, contains little potassium, a sudden change occurs. The resting potential drops to a small fraction of its former value. It is equally simple to replace the original solution and to restore the resting potential. The resting potential, therefore, depends on the high internal concentration of potassium ions. This surprising technique, then, has been extremely successful. At about the same time, Dr. Tasaki and his colleagues found that they could drill out a central core of axoplasm. Their technique, which is very different to those previously used at Plymouth, is rather less drastic, so that a cleaned axon can be used. The axon is laid out horizontally in a pool of liquid and held in place by a thread attached at each end. When the position of the axon is correct, the usual small notch is cut in it to receive the cannula. In this method, the cannula has to be guided along the whole length of the axon without damaging the membrane, and the double image technique is again used, but with a prism instead of a mirror. The cannula itself is a long, thin glass tube, which, during its passage along the axon, removes the central core of axoplasm. This is achieved by the experimenter, here John Kimura, gently sucking on the cannula so that as it passes down the axon, axoplasm is drawn into it. Another notch is cut in the far end and the cannula passed through it. A positive pressure is now applied to the perfusion liquid within the cannula and the viscous axoplasm rinsed out. The internal electrode, which is on exactly the same axis, is now brought up and its tip inserted into the end of the cannula. While the electrode is within the cannula, both are moved in unison to the middle of the axon. Here, the internal electrode remains, but the cannula is brought back to its starting point and secured with thread. All that remains now is to remove the prism and to bring into position the external electrodes. The particular value of this elaborate and powerful technique is that it permits a cleaned axon to be perfused. It is one of the many techniques which physiologists have developed since the importance of research on the squid's giant axon was first recognized some 40 years ago. Since then, many scientists from many parts of the world have become deeply involved in its study. The results of their work have greatly increased our understanding of the mechanism of nervous conduction not only in the squid, but in every animal, including man. But, as the autumn days draw in, the laboratory ships still return with their cargoes of squid. 
for many problems remain. How, for instance, does the membrane distinguish between different ions? And what is the mechanism which brings about the changes in permeability? Every winter, therefore, in fair weather or foul, the work of the ships and their crews continues, for the squid giant axon has still much to teach us. Small wonder, then, that each day's haul is eagerly awaited. That results are discussed and experiments made, often far into the night, for this is the work which has provided the basis for modern neurophysiology. At marine laboratories like those at Plymouth in England and Woods Hole in America, the squid, therefore, is a very important animal.